The Pre-Med Years is part of the MedEd Media Network at mededmedia.com. This is the Pre-Med Year, session number 222. Hello and welcome to the two-time Academy Award-nominated podcast, The Pre-Med Years, where we believe that collaboration, not competition, is key to your pre-med success. I'm your host, Dr. Ryan Gray, and in this podcast, we share with you stories, encouragement, and information that you need to know to help guide you on your path to becoming a physician. Now, welcome to the Pre-Med Years. As I said in the intro, my name is Dr. Ryan Gray, and I host several podcasts here on the MedEd Media Network, M-E-D-E-D-Media.com. I host the Old Pre-Meds Podcast for non-traditional pre-med students. I host the MCAT Podcast for students that are preparing for the MCAT. I co-host that one with Next Step Test Prep. And I also host the new Specialty Stories Podcast where I talk to specialists about their career choices and what life is like as that type of specialty, specialist, I guess. So go check out all of those podcasts that we have to offer at mededmedia.com. Today's podcast is, or today's guest is an awesome guest who is very similar to somebody I had on the podcast previously. Now, if you've heard of Jessica's story in uh, session 168, you can hear at medicalschoolhq.net slash 168. Jessica was an actress turned pre-med student and received 10 acceptances to medical school. Our guest today is a professional athlete, and you'll hear what kind of professional athlete turned pre-med and now is up to six acceptances to medical school. And we talk through her journey and what has been successful for her, even though it's taken her a little bit longer to uh, finish her prereqs and finish her bachelor's degree and and everything else that goes along with working full-time and being a professional athlete and being pre-med and the, the, those struggles that came with that, but also how that has helped her on the interview trail and, and why she thinks that has made her successful. So let's go and jump in and say hello to Zane. Zane, welcome to the pre-med year. Thanks for joining me. Hi, thank you for having me. I am very interested to know when you knew you wanted to be a professional flying trapeze artist? Um, I have to say, and this is the answer people usually give uh, when asked when they knew they wanted to be a doctor, <laughs> uh, but when I was around 11, I went to a summer camp, and I actually chose that camp because I saw that they had a, a circus arts program, and it just for some reason... Um, was very enticing to me. And I went to that camp and I tried the flying trapeze and I absolutely loved it. Um, and I think from that point on, I kind of knew it was something I needed to pursue seriously. What does that mean that you needed to pursue it? Um, I was just right away very enthralled by the whole apparatus, I guess I would say. And then um, I kept going back to that summer camp every summer because I was so into the flying trapeze. Um, I also grew up in New York City, so there happened to be a flying trapeze school, which you can't find everywhere. So I was able to try it out even more. And it was just kind of a feeling that that it was something that was so interesting to me. Um, and then once I learned a little bit more about circuses and performing and what that would look like, it, it was even more interesting you know, I saw a couple professional circus shows when I was younger, and that kind of made it an even stronger desire. And I think towards the end of high school is when it became a real idea that I started planning for because I kind of realized that it would be something I would pursue at that point, obviously not when I was a bit older. So the, the real decision and the actions started towards the end of high school. How does one know that they're cut out to be a professional trapeze artist? Uh, I mean, like I said, I had been doing it for a couple of years at that point, And the people that I had working with me at the summer camp had a little bit of professional performing experience, not much, um, but enough to kind of help me understand what it would take. 
and to encourage me uh, once I started talking about wanting to perform. And then the same thing happened with the people I was working with at that trapeze school in New York. Uh, There were a few people who had some performing experience. And once I started asking them about it, they encouraged me. Um, They told me that I, you know, I had the potential. At that point, I definitely didn't have what it took yet to perform. Mm. Um, But they said if I was interested, I had the potential. And, you know, I won't go into a crazy amount of circus detail about the actual skills, but there's the flying trapeze, which is what I pursued and what I do. Um, And then there's kind of static aerial apparatuses. So they're solo things. You do them alone. They don't swing around. They kind of just hang up high and you do um, performances on them. And I did a bit of that as well. So at that point, I didn't know which apparatus I would, you know, perform on, but I was most attracted to the performing idea. And then I I guess I, at that point, thought I would figure out the details later. So you got so involved in this that you decided that school wasn't necessary for you. And after high school, you skipped college and said, this is what I'm going to do. How... How did that go over with your parents <laughs> that that you were giving up education to go be a, a circus show? To run away and join the circus, yeah, literally. Exactly. Um, well, I didn't quite do it that way. What I did was, because I was a very interested and, and dedicated student all throughout elementary school, high school, all the way you know up to that point. Um, and it was clear that I liked learning and liked school, so... First of all, I think my parents knew and I probably reassured them that I would go back and and also have school in my life at some point. I didn't just finish high school and move on. I always knew that I would go back and study. So what I did was in my senior year of high school, I applied to university. I got in and I deferred for a year thinking I would take a gap year. So I had that on paper option for the following year. It just didn't end up going that way, but I I definitely had that set up. And um, it wasn't until later when I realized that, you know, I could actually, quote unquote, make it in this field as a trapeze artist that I kind of canceled my admission to that school that I had deferred from and and just did it a whole other way a bit later. Um, So they, yeah, they had, they had an idea that I would go back and on paper, at least, we had my school that I could go to the, the, the next year if everything fell apart. Okay. So you got into school and you said, ah, let me give it a shot and see, which is great. Yes. Looking back, if you weren't a flying trapeze artist, if you didn't find that passion, what would you have studied your go- going into university? Definitely not pre-med. But uh, I think at the time I was very interested in international relations. Um, I might have done something more along the social sciences or uh, or international relations at that point. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So you were not ever interested in being a doctor, or pre-med, any of that? No. And I, in fact, didn't have great experiences in the major sciences in high school. So if you had told me at that time that that's what I would end up doing. I would not have believed you. (laughs) Awesome. So you end up with a great job in a well-known show. And at what point did, did medicine start creeping into the picture? Well, before I landed this job, I spent about two years in and out of New York city, um, training, performing on and off, and also taking a few classes. So I did have that entire, you know, gap year, the year after high school, where I just trained and did a little bit of performing. Um, But starting the next fall, so a year out of high school, I enrolled in two, I want to say two classes at a university in New York where I could just do adult continuing education. Um, And they were, again, not at all pre-med. It was like a creative writing class and, you know, a food politics class, just stuff that I thought was fun because I started missing school already at that point. Um, the following year, I think I took a statistics and another, uh, politics class. So I, w- I had a couple credits under my belt by the time I moved for this job to Florida. And 
I guess I knew I wanted to go back to school and study. I still didn't know what, but over the couple years that had passed, as I kind of became an athlete more and more, you know, a professional athlete, I guess, I developed uh, an interest in nutrition uh, and just in, in the human body in general. You know, I was using my body in a new way and nutrition was kind of a very direct um, accessible way to look at kind of cause and effect with working with your body. Uh, and my body was, you know, the test subject and I didn't really have any resources while I was performing and traveling. So that's just something I thought about. And I, you know, read articles about nutrition at that time. So by the time that I was in Florida and, and thought about enrolling in school, I was thinking I would study nutrition. Um, and thankfully the university of central Florida, where I went, didn't have a nutrition major. So I did preclinical health sciences and thought that I would do a master's in nutrition. So I was on the health path. And it wasn't until a couple years later that I had a little bit of time off from work with an injury. And I had more time to really think about what I was interested in. And I, I always say that I, I didn't decide medicine. I realized that it had been leading up to medicine for years at that point. How did you do um, that? What what made you realize? I guess my moment was I was I was in a class that was just kind of a professional development class for health professionals and we were talking about autonomous healthcare professions. So it was kind of this discussion about scope of practice and the order of the team in the healthcare workplace. And I think when we started talking about the physician's role on that team, it was something that I had been interested in. And, and I think I just hadn't admitted it to myself because I knew what a daunting path it was. But what had happened was the more preclinical health sciences courses I took, which was my major, my interest just kept expanding. So, you know, I took anatomy and everything that I took, I just wanted to know more and more and I wanted larger scope of knowledge. Um, so when I, when we had that one discussion about, you know, autonomy and just the role and, and I realized, I guess, that my one hang up was how much work I knew went into changing my path to pre-med. And I finally, I don't know, I don't know why I just kind of allowed myself to admit that that's what I wanted. And then then I had to start thinking about all that work I had to do for it. <laughs> so you were working full time as yes. a performer, as a professional athlete, as you called it. It's pretty cool. You you then make this life altering decision that's that you realized you needed to be a doctor. How did you go about figuring out what you needed to do? Who did you talk to? Where did you get your information? And how did that jive with working full time? Well, I guess it never occurred to me, first of all, to not work full time. There was no part time option at my job and quitting was also not an option for me, both financially and because at that point I'd only been in this job for three or four years and I love it and I just wasn't quite ready to stop. I also think that I you know, I knew it would be difficult to do both, but I wanted to be closer to knowing I could do med school before I let go of the other, you know, day job. So I knew that I would have to make it work uh, within my current schedule. The next thing was I actually my my best friend is is in her fourth year of medical school. She's graduating in the spring. And I spoke to her. Um, I have another very good friend who's who at the time was a resident. I spoke to him and another good friend who was a year is a year ahead of me. So she's now MS1. At the time she was uh, starting to apply or maybe taking the MCAT. So I spoke to all the people I knew who were somewhere along this path. Um, and I think one, one of my biggest first steps after deciding was kind of outing myself to my close family and friends to hold myself accountable and to get some support, which is what I got. So that helped a lot. And then from there, I went to the uh, pre-health advising office at my school, which was uh, a rude awakening. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean by that? Well, I thought, you know, my major is not the traditional pre-med major, but there is no, you know, quote unquote, pre-med track at the school. So I didn't realize how far off I was going to be. And we sat down and looked at the prereqs that I had and didn't have. 
And that was a bit daunting in itself. I think I had at that time bio one, chem one, me and chem two, uh, and anatomy and physiology. So I was still missing a lot, you know, orgos and biochem and a lot of the hard stuff, yeah. as well as some other stuff that just didn't come up in my major. So that was already kind of scary to me. And then when we started talking about, um, you know, trying to get some volunteering in and and research and shadowing, it just became a big list. Um, that obviously wasn't enough to stop me, but it definitely made me sit back and say, okay, I knew this was a big decision. Um, it's a lot of work. I knew it would be. And even though I now have this huge list of things that I should work on, there was something encouraging about unlocking kind of the secret of what it took that that helped me deal with how daunting it was at the same time. Yeah. You, so you're talking to your pre-med advisors at the school, pre-health advising office at UCF, four-year state college, state institution. How helpful were they in, in helping you find courses that you could take at that school that also worked with your full-time schedule? They, um, and I should mention that I got, the prereqs that I just listed that I already had at that point, I believe all of them were from community college because okay. there are several good community colleges in the area. And I was enrolled at UCF, but I could take the classes at the community college and they would direct connect. Um, and they were cheaper, closer to home, smaller class sizes. So I had done a lot of those. Um, and in that first meeting, they did mention that not all med schools necessarily accept those courses. And if they do, they don't always love that. Mm -hmm. So that was another thing is that we knew going forward, I really needed to get the rest of my prereqs at the university. Nobody sat down with me and said, let's talk about your schedule and what days work for you. Because my schedule is so complicated and I'd been scheduling all of my school thus far within it that I kind of took that on by myself. Um, and I ended up, you know, doing some pretty funky stuff in terms of scheduling, but that's something that I, I myself managed. Okay. Talk about working full time and taking all of these courses and preparing for the MCAT. Were there any times where you're like, why am I doing this? I love my career. Why am I continuing to kill myself with school to go on and, and do this thing that maybe I, I'll like? There were no moments where I had that thought. Uh, once I decided it was full speed ahead. There were moments where I thought, am I going to make it? Um, you know, am I going to have the good enough GPA? Am I, how am I ever going to take this MCAT? There were definitely moments where I was worried about my success in becoming a med student, but I never considered, um, you know, not doing it. And I never considered that my career that I currently have was good enough because it's, it's a, it's a very physical and limited career. So I always knew I would, you know, I would have to switch gears at some point. You know, you can't be a flying trapeze artist in your late 30s. So, yeah, um, yeah I, never, I never stopped and thought, I already have something that I love. Why do this? It, it was like, this is awesome. I'm going to have something else that I love when I retire from the thing that I love so much. I never thought I'd love my job again. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, working full time while doing the the whole pre med track is, you know, if you can avoid it, I would. Um, but it's not impossible. There were times I'd say it was about a year and a half that I was doing a full time course, a full course load, and working full time. Um, before that, I had been kind of part time student and always working full time. The year and a half that I was doing both full time was all about kind of keeping my head down and doing what I needed to do in the moment. So there were a lot of days when I was, you know, up at seven, I live an hour away from the university. So driving early at school for a couple of hours in the car, driving straight to work an hour away, doing an hour or two of training and then getting ready for my show and then doing two shows, finishing work at 11 p.m., and repeating five days a week. So it was a rough schedule. And what I did was I found time 
once I, once I realized that I didn't need like a five hour chunk to study, I just had to study whenever possible. That helped a lot. So I would find an hour, you know, before the show would start or another hour between my two shows in the evening, um, and just put on my headphones and go wherever I was. And I think that is a really important thing to do is, is to realize that whenever you have a minute, you should be studying. You don't need, you know, a dedicated study day or hour. Cause I didn't have that. And you make it work. Did you tell your work at all that you were on this path and, and did they help you once they realized what you were doing? I didn't tell them at that point because there was no help they could give me really. You know, I, I wasn't going to sign up for a class that would have me missing any part of my work day consistently. Cause that, you know, they wouldn't let me do that. I knew that ahead of time. Um, it's a very strict schedule. And I, uh, yeah, I just didn't, I didn't really think there was any way they could help me. So I told some close friends at work for the social support um, and the accountability, like I mentioned before, but I didn't tell anyone, you know, high up at work. When I finally spoke to them, it was coming up on interview season because I knew that if I got interviews, I would need time off with very short notice. So that's when it became important to to kind of loop them in. But before that, I kind of just kept it to myself. And how were they when you made that kind of revelation to them to say, hey, I'm going to be going for interviews. I'm going to need some time off here and there. They were surprised, <laughs> um, but very supportive. Yeah, my artistic director, who's who's my boss, was has to this date has given me every day that I've asked for off of work for an interview and the surrounding days if I needed them Good. without questions. Nice. Definitely very, helps to have that support. Very supportive in general. So Good. I'm Talk, lucky in that way. Yeah. Talk about your your selection of schools. You you did well on the MCAT. It and you finished up with a great GPA. You took six years to finish your undergrad, right? Yes. Was there was there any thought about, wow, medical schools are going to look at how long it took me to complete the MCAT. They're going to see that I did a lot of my prereqs at a community college. They they aren't going to take me seriously. Was Did you have that thought in the back of your head? Absolutely. Um, I could almost picture them seeing, you know, flying trapeze artist on my application <laughs> and just laughing. <laughs> so I knew from the very beginning that there were certain areas of my application that were not, I'm not going to say weak because as we know, they never, we never know exactly what they're looking for. Um, but there were areas of my application that I thought I needed to balance out. So you mentioned obviously my MCAT score in deciding where I would apply. Well, I didn't have my MCAT score when I made my list. Um, I really pushed the time limit. I graduated in May, 2016 and took the MCAT early July and I did not, I planned to start studying during my last semester, but it didn't happen. So I was preparing for my application, like, right, you know, finishing up my personal statement, doing the rest of the application and studying for the MCAT May, June, beginning of July. And I had my list all written. And then of course I didn't get my scores until early August. My application was already submitted. Everything was already in. So what I did was I applied to 22 schools. Um, really, really wide range in terms of, I don't know, average stats, even location, um, you know, emphasis on research, everything, just a very wide range. And I mostly used geography as my guide. And then I threw in a couple kind of dream schools um, just for why not. And then once I got my MCAT score, I guess I could have changed my list of schools but I, I didn't. I, it was already mid-August. Everything was in besides the MCAT score. And I just thought, you know what, I have enough of a range that I think I'm going to hit some of them. And to answer your question about whether I thought there were things that schools wouldn't take seriously, um, that didn't directly affect my decision on which schools to apply to, except that, like I said, I had a, a range. But what it did affect was how I addressed the remaining parts of my application. Um, I couldn't change the fact that it took me six years to get my bachelor's degree. I couldn't change what I do for a living and I couldn't go back and change 
having taken some courses at the community college. Um, but like I mentioned earlier, once I, you know, spoke to an advisor, I realized I needed to take the rest of my prereqs at the university. I needed to get A's. And I knew I needed to do, I, I, I needed to crush the MCAT if possible, because um, I needed to kind of balance out the very artsy, unconventional parts of my application with a little proof of my scientific rigor, as they call it. Yeah, your your aptitude for right science. Okay, and so you proved that. Talk to me about how you went about framing your story. Obviously, you have the opportunity to tell your story in your personal statement and the extracurriculars that you choose to put down. How did you how did you go about figuring out what your story was uh, for your application and then how to talk about it during your interviews? Well, I'll say this also to anyone who's preparing to write a personal statement. <laughs> One good reason to start early. There are a million good reasons to start early. One is that um, I must have 15 personal statement drafts that are like four pages and I still haven't gotten to the point yet. <laughs> so <laughs> it obviously took me a long time to figure out how to frame my story. Um, there's a lot of different places that I could start. There's a lot of different areas I could focus on, especially because my, um, you know, my, my decision to go into medicine was, it, it was kind of slow. It started with just deciding on healthcare. There was no aha moment. And then I have this crazy career that I've had so far. So it took me a long time to figure out how to kind of get to the point and then, um, you know, talk about how I'm prepared for it because of what I've done so far. Um, how and why trapeze besides, you know, I loved it. So I went to go try it. Um, then talking about some of my experiences before I got my current job, because during that time, I spent a lot of time on the road traveling throughout the U.S. in a trailer with my performance troupe. And those were some really interesting times kind of socially. And um, in retrospect, a lot of the things that I saw during that time have shaped my interest in public health and, you know, Dis health disparities. And, and those are all things that affect my desire to go into medicine. So I ended up talking a lot about that time because, yeah, I was, I was working with a lot of people from all over the world, um, a lot of people with different levels of education, with some pre-existing health conditions. And I also, in my line of work, saw a lot of accidents. So there were a lot of interesting moments during that time that I focused on. Um, and then in terms of my current job, I talked about the opportunities I've had there um, within my job. And then, of course, what we just talked about with balancing that job full time and the pre-med track. And somewhere in summarizing all of that, I ended up kind of hitting some some basic themes and finding a way to round it all out. But it was not easy, like, you know, connecting a totally different career that makes sense to me um, and, and trying to show other people why the transition makes sense is, was definitely the hardest thing I did in this application process. Yeah. Interesting. I bet, I bet it's an interesting read. Talk to <laughs> I me. Think so. Yeah. Talk, talk about your interview. So you've had a very successful interview season at nine interviews at this point, or actually more interview invites at this point. Yeah, I've had um, 10 invites, I've done eight, and I have two scheduled. Two scheduled. And how many acceptances at this point? Six acceptances and one uh, wait list. Ah, oh, man, that one. That <laughs> one is the one you, you think about all the time, I'm sure. Like, why didn't, why didn't they want me? Uh, yeah, and that one was my only MMI, so I'm like, uh, is there a connection there? Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. So... Very unusual backstory. How much of the interview was discussing your job? A lot. Um, every single interview I've had has at least, every interviewer has at least asked about it. Some more than others. And it's funny, it ended up being kind of a filter point for me because some of the schools 
mentioned it as this weird thing I did. We have to mention it, but now let's move on, which is fine. Mm -hmm. Um, And some schools really wanted to know about it. And I've ended up really feeling more comfortable at the schools that, that asked a lot more about this career, not just because, you know, they asked more about, you know, my interests, I guess, but because it was very telling to me about the level to which they kind of understood what I'm about. So the places that asked me more about it and we went more into depth about, you know, my work as a performer and on a T, te- you know, I work on a team of, of trapeze artists and the people who kind of understood that connection with teamwork and working in a risky environment and working in a very diverse workforce and the people who saw those connections tended to be the people at the schools that I've been more drawn to. Do you think that they just understood you a little bit more and accepted you for who you were? Yeah, I think those were the schools that invited me because of who I was, whereas maybe a couple of the schools invited me because of maybe my my stats or, you know, I'm a more I'm older, maybe I'm a more mature student, my work experience in general, but despite the fact that what I did was a little bit crazy in my work so far. So your story, if if you're listening to this and you go, "Wow, Zane has an amazing story." Go listen to episode 168 medicalschoolhq.net slash 168, where I talked to Jessica, who's very similar to Zane, having a performance background and getting tons of interviews, obviously doing well in school, that's, that's kind of the prereq, but getting a ton of interviews and having these discussions about prior careers and, and what you have done and what Jessica has done. So it's, it's, I, I always like to, to, tell these stories and have people on. So I'm thankful that you actually reached out to me to come on and tell your story because it just, it goes to show that having this unique background, even though it was non-medical makes you stand out so much. And when somebody looks at that application, they go, wow, I want to talk to Zane because that's cool. Right. And it, it showed during your interviews that the, that's what these people wanted to do. They just wanted to talk to you and find out more about who you were. Yeah. And I would just say, you know, you can't create a story in your application that isn't true. So if you're someone who went straight out of high school, straight to college, knew you were pre med, you know, went through four years and now you're applying and, and you haven't worked full time in a different field or, you know, you, ha- you don't have such a crazy non-traditional story. The bottom line for me was, you know, despite the fact that I've done something really different, I know that medicine is my next path and I have to find a way to articulate it to convince these admissions people that medicine is right for me. But if you know that it's definitely what you want to go into next, despite what you've done so far, whether you've been pre-med because you've known for a while or suddenly you want to do it, that's enough. You know, you have to do everything it takes. You have to check off all of the boxes and, and you have to work hard for the application. But I think the takeaway from my story is not, you know, make sure you have something weird on your application that they're going to, that's going to stand out, but that no matter who you are, if you know, for sure, there's nothing about you that, precludes you from going into that path. You know, you know, you know why find a way to convince them, but you knowing is enough no matter what, what else you have going on. Yeah. So you have six, six acceptances at this point. Let's talk about how you are figuring out where to go because in your email to me, you said you got into your top choice, yet you have new interview invites and you're going to them. How how are you deciding or why are you deciding to go on more interviews even though you've gotten into your top choice? And how are you going to narrow down where you're going to go? Well, I guess I should clarify, and I may have misstated this in my email, that I have a current top choice. Oh, okay. Um, and that was definitely my top choice in Florida. So I applied, I'm, like I mentioned, I'm from New York and I've lived in Florida now for a bit over six years. So I'm a Florida resident um, and I, and I like it here. I've been here for a long time, but I also 
am willing to go back home to New York. So I applied to all of the schools and all of the MD schools, I should say, in Florida, a bunch in New York and a few in between. And I guess I just thought, you know, either the decision will be made for me and I'll be happy no matter what, or if I have to make a choice, it will be clear. And, you know, again, not complaining, it's a great situation to be in, but I do have choices now. Um, and it's proving a very difficult decision to make. And that's why I am still taking interviews for schools that I'm very interested in uh, because they're, you know, their top choices, they're just, <laughs> they're in different places and they're very different schools. So it's, it's ending up being a bigger range to choose from than I expected. And how are you going to narrow those down? One thing that a lot of people told me before I started interviewing that turned out to be pretty true was that there's definitely a gut feeling on interview day. Um, you might not know it when you have like a mediocre gut feeling. I mean, I'm sure I haven't had any really bad feelings. I'm sure that is pretty obvious when it happens. Um, I've at least liked every single school that I've interviewed at and I've loved a lot of them, but there are a few that stand out as these are my people. Um, that's the only way I can really describe it. Like I can think of two schools I've interviewed at where I've thought I already feel like these are my friends. Um, and that's been a really important factor for me to consider because, you know, I need that support group. And, and it also just tells me that there's probably some shared values and shared goals there. So those are the two schools that I'm the most focused on. And then the ones that I have interviews coming, I guess I'm just going to see what gut feelings come from those interview days. Uh, and then there's the second look option if I get to that point and still don't know, but I'm waiting, I'm still waiting on some decisions. So it's, it's a long process. Well, you've obviously been very successful on your journey. You have done things that a lot of pre-med students are told they can't do by take, taking prereqs in community college, taking six years to get your bachelor's degree. You've, yep. you've shown them that you can do it and obviously be successful doing it. What words of wisdom, some last words of wisdom do you have for the pre-med student who is out there in community college and freaking out about their chances of getting into med school because they, they think they're doing the wrong thing? I would say, so the way I describe my whole pre-med experience is DIY, right? Do it yourself. Like everything that I, I had help, but I kind of looked at the list of things I needed, prerequisite classes, a certain number of them at a university, um, experience in, in a clinical environment, all of these things. And I didn't, you know, go to my advisor and say, how can I do all of these things within my schedule at the university? I just saw them as experiences that would help me along the way. And I, and I found my way of doing them. So what I would say is there's no strict guideline in terms of timeline, where you do your, your classes. I mean, I also have classes from four different schools, um, you know, your age, what you do in your spare time. They, I think variety is valued, first of all, and we're starting to see that more and more. And there's a lot more wiggle room than you think. So don't get caught up in checking things off how your advisor might tell you to do that or in the order that you're told to do them in. Um, you know, don't get caught up trying to do everything the way that your your peers are doing it. Just do it in your way, um, you know, in a timeline that makes sense to you. Prioritize being yourself throughout the process, because I think that comes through. And um, one thing that helped me throughout the process, since it did take me a while, both getting my bachelor's degree and getting everything ready to apply to medical school was, you know, keep your eye on the long-term goal, but at the same time, keep your head down on what you're doing right now, because it's very easy in this process to think about um, you know, I, I want to be a doctor. So I get to think about applying to med school. I have to think about the MCAT. I have to think about my personal statement. I have to think about after that, I have to think about, you know, step one and residency and where I'm going to be. And it's such a long process. And there are so many boxes to check along the way that kind of 
keeping in touch with where you are in the moment is was for me the only way to to get everything done to my best ability. So stay focused on the phase you're in right now because there's a lot of phases ahead of you. You'll get there when you get there. And the only thing you can do right now about everything coming down the line is ace what you're doing right now. All right. Again, that was Zane. Zane, thank you for joining me on the podcast and sharing your story. Amazing story. Obviously, six acceptances is phenomenal, but it just goes to show you having this non-traditional path, whether you're an actress like Jessica was back in 168, like Zane is here as a professional flying trapeze artist, whatever you've done in your path, in your past, is going to stand out as something different, as a non-traditional student. It's just a matter of figuring out how to tell your story through your personal statement and through your interviews. So you have to figure out how to do that and do it well to be successful. I want to take a second and thank a few people that have left us ratings and reviews. We have Greatness2 that says, Too Great to Relate. This says, This podcast is the best medical school advice all packed on my phone. Thank you for that greatness too. We have something roar, S Rome roar that says a must for every pre-med as a non-traditional URM student. This podcast has been one of my best sources of advice during my years as a pre-med. Thank you for that review. S Rome roar. We have one from I have no idea how to pronounce that. Something Gallon says, by far my favorite podcast. This is the best resource for pre-med students by far. Thank you for that review. And one more from Junior Undergrad, studying MD to DNP to MD. Says this podcast has given me the information I need to get the confidence to gear my gores towards medicine again. I'm a female and being from the Midwest, I've always been encouraged to be a mid-level provider and then eventually to switch to nursing so I can, quote unquote, have a family. When I couldn't get med school out of my head, the pre-med years guided me back and encouraged me to go for what I love. Plus, you guys are a double physician family, which will be in the boat I'm in if I make it to that point. I really appreciate the information and will continue to listen. Awesome. Thank you very much for that review. Good luck on your journey. If you would like to leave a rating and review, you can do so at medicalschoolhq.net slash iTunes. I hope you have a great week ahead of you. And if you have not listened to every episode that we have to offer, I suggest you do. Go back and listen to them all. Download them all on your phone while you're on a Wi-Fi signal so that you can uh, not incur data overages on your cellular data plan. But I hope you have a great week and listen to lots more podcasts and follow up with us next week here at the pre-med years.